morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with Randall. Uh, a big conversation about fintech and the future of this company uh, and its relationship to the world that I think all of you are spending your time thinking about uh, today. And we're going we're to talk about the future of telecom and AT&T and how I think that's going to empower and change uh, the world that we're all living in. But I wanted to start with this, because I was thinking about fintech and the telecommunications world. And I don't know if everybody remembers this, but back in the late 90s and early aughts, uh, there was a thought that the telecom companies were in some ways going to become banks. They were going to become financial services uh, companies. I want to read you a quote. This is David Osborne from Booz, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, who was published in the Wall Street Journal, 2001. Wireless service providers now have the wherewithal to disintermediate credit card associations such as Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Mobile devices with their range of interactive functions and ability to deliver information in real time have the potential eventually to overpower today's static plastic credit card. Payments could become a killer app for wireless telephony with coolness, convenience, and low cost, the core value propositions. What a great vision. It is a great vision, and it's a vision we all live with today, but it wasn't done by the telecom companies themselves. Why do you think that never happened? <laughs> I don't know if Beth, you were still on the board when we, uh, <laughs> this is a funny, uh, we did, we tried. I, I should say we tried. And it was a, uh, it, it obviously, since nobody knows about it, it didn't do very well. And uh, there was a group of wireless providers who said, we don't want to disintermediate banks, but we want to create a payment environment. How do these smartphones that everybody is now carrying become the vehicle by which commerce and payments are made? And so we created a joint venture, stood up a JV, and we hired a CEO, and, and we began developing this technology. We, we put an organization together. Some great technology was developed. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't try to disintermediate banks. We said, you want in this platform, American Express, or City, or J.P. Morgan, or whoever, you get into this platform, but this will be the payment vehicle. And, uh, and we went through this, uh, the organization went through this great branding strategy, and we stood up a company in a product <laughs> named ISIS. <laughs> this was before ISIS, all right? <laughs> and along comes ISIS, you know, the one that we all read about in the newspaper all the time. We said, wow, that doesn't feel very good. We rebranded the company and uh, ended up selling the platform to Google. And it is now the platform for Google Pay. Wow. So but why, do you, why do you think, it does it matter that effectively the telecom companies themselves are not owning that, la that last mile, if you will, when it comes to the payment piece? Because you now have, and we can talk about Apple uh, uh, getting into business with, with uh, Goldman Sachs, with their credit card and everybody else, but the PayPal's of the world, everybody else who's built on top of this. Yeah, I'll give you my, pers my, my view, the AT&T view is, I, I don't care. When we went down the, the path of ISIS, the motivation was you wanted the mobile environment, the mobile device to be the core of how commerce is done. We want the mobile device to be how entertainment is consumed. We want the mobile device to be just how transactions are done. And, and you know, if we need to be in the middle of it to accelerate it and make it happen, then, you know, we'll step up and do it. We'd rather not, but we just want the mobile platform to be a ubiquitous platform used for all these things. So security is critical, right? If you don't get security right, none of this stuff takes off. But as to whether we own a mobile payments platform or not, you know, it, it's not that big a deal. The reason I ask, though, is you did make a decision about two years ago now to get into the entertainment business, right? right? Historically, the entertainment product was consumed over your network, but you didn't own it yourself. And so it's one thing to not necessarily feel like you need to be the bank, but then speak to, speak to the strategic rationale then of the entertainment piece and how that's the distinction between that and the financial tech piece. So a lot of people try to think about the acquisition of Time Warner from the standpoint of why do you need entertainment? to sit on top of this distribution business? How does that help your distribution business? And it's the wrong question. The, the question, and Jeff Bukas and I spent a lot of time talking about this, and that is, how much could it enhance the value of a media company if they were attached to a big distribution business? I mean, think about it that way. And, and if you recall back in 2016, when we did this deal, 
It was a time when everybody was saying, oh my, these media companies are overvalued. You remember what was happening to stock prices back then? They were, they were being crushed. And uh, Disney had had its first year-over-year -year decline in subscribers on ESPN. And, and so these stocks were getting hammered. We are sitting here thinking, wow, we're moving into a world where we're going to invest billions and billions of dollars into video distribution networks. That's what these things are becoming. And 5G takes it to a whole different level. And so if you could acquire a media company for a reasonable price, do you think the values of that are going to go up or down as you have all new broad distribution for this media? We believe that premium media valuations would go up. I think we proved that we were right. And, uh, and the media valuations have really come back. They've come back nicely. And uh, so now think about taking a media company, standing up a direct-to-consumer platform, because this is HBO and Warner Brothers Studios. This is an intellectual property library that is unlike anything else. And Warner Brothers is a production studio at a scale that few others can even talk about. Standing up a product that takes advantage of all of that, a very unique product, and they now have, they have 170 million customers and distribution points to shove that out through, through wireless broadband or TV product. They can scale it just on the AT&T distribution, but you want to sell it everywhere. And, uh, and so this is the play we're running. We have amazing data over here in this distribution company. Why is that important? It enhances the value of a media company. In fact, if this media company can monetize advertising at the same level we do over here, it's worth a lot of money. And so the reality is a distribution company can really enhance the value of a media company, and that's the play we're running. Okay, I have a data question for you that relates right. to that. I wasn't gonna go there this early in the conversation, but I will in part because I mentioned the Apple announcement with the Goldman Sachs credit card. We can talk about FinTech in a second, but it relates to this. Part of the rationale I always thought with, the t with owning content was the data piece. Um, because you'd be able to see what everybody's really watching and be able to make some It is part of the rationale. However, my understanding is that the relationship that an HBO, for example, will have as part of an Apple deal in the future, and we didn't get all the specifics on this, is that a lot of the companies that are providing, uh, whether it's Showtime or HBO or others, may not have the same level of access to the data, meaning Apple all of a sudden will get access to the data. How do you think about that? It's critical. The data is... It, it's foundational to everything we're doing. So you can assume that if we do a deal to distribute HBO through a certain digital distributor. Like an Apple. Just pick the one you want to pick, that uh, we will have access to data. It's, it's critical to everything we're trying to do. It's critical to the content creation algorithm. It's critical to advertising delivery. It's critical to marketing. It's, just, it's, it's really critical to everything we're trying to do. And so how do you think about the, the direct-to-consumer piece with all of these other players who are trying to be intermediaries and how you do business with them? Uh, you mean in terms of from a Warner Media standpoint? Yeah, how from do I a think Warner Media standpoint, or for, I mean, more broadly speaking, the reason I ask it is because there's a lot of, a lot of people out there, whether it's a Roku box or this box, and you're going to be passing your content. Some of them, some of them want to be able to stream it or, or run it off of their own servers. Some of them want, to, it's, want it to be, you want it to be a direct-to-consumer play. How does all that work? So as we think about spending anywhere from 10 to $12 billion a year on content creation, that's kind of what we spend on an annual basis. And uh, my view is you want the broadest distribution you can get if you're spending that kind of money on content creation. Uh, we will be standing up our own direct-to-consumer platform. We think we can do some things with it that are truly unique, that we can drive subscribers to it. But we're not going to be exclusive. If HBO gets distribution on Roku, that's going to be really, really important. And so we want broad distribution. And, and by the way, not all markets are created equal. For example, in Europe, HBO content is distributed not under the HBO brand per se, but through Sky, a company that you, it's affiliated with the company you work for. And so that's a great monetization model. So not every, you know, there's not going to be this one ubiquitous, we're not going to be Netflix. We're distributing one way through one channel, you know, just kind of one direction. We're going to have multiple distribution channels here. Our direct-to-consumer is going to be critical to us, but distributing through DirecTV, you know, HBO through DirecTV, we'll still do that. It's still going to be a big-scale business as well. Um, because I mentioned before the Apple, the Apple credit card with, with Goldman Sachs, do you ever think about, I mean, I know we talked about the, the, the ISIS product, but do you ever think maybe there should be uh, an AT&T credit card? <laughs> there is. It's still out there, actually. Do you believe that? 
think it was on the Discovery I remember that, platform. the AT&T Universal, yeah. Universal card. But yeah. I mean, as, as, a new, as a new business. No, I don't, I don't see that fitting with what we're trying to do. There are too many alternatives, and that's just, there are people who do that business, and they do it really, really well. They don't need AT&T involved in that. Is there any fintech company out there right now that you go, hmm, that's clever? I either wished we had that, wished we had done it, or I'm just intrigued and interested in it? There was a time when I used to spend a lot of mental cycles thinking about that. I, I have totally shifted my, my thinking. I want all of those flowers to bloom. I really do. I, candidly, I've spent some time with the SoFi guys. I think they're an interesting model, using social and all the characteristics and the data of social to drive an interesting FinTech model. I do like their model. I, I think it has a unique marketing perspective, but in terms of what are the FinTech guys that I look at and say, wow, that's unique, there's not one that I really look at and I say, wow, I wish we had that. Uh, you've invested in the blockchain. We have. And I believe that uh, you personally own a little bit of Bitcoin yourself. <laughs> I, I, I can't get to it, though. I, uh, <laughs> what do you when mean? It, when it was trading at 19000 I go, son of a gun, that's worth a lot of money. And uh, so I retained some guys to, to go after it and say, if you can get it, we'll contribute it to charity. But uh, anyway, it was, Hold on, though. But you bought it originally when? I didn't buy it. It was, we were all talking about it. <clears throat> this was a, a this wow, is, what, this what is year? back in 2000, I'm guessing, 12, 13, I'm okay. guessing. And uh, a group of us were talking about it and just, you know, socially, what is this? What do we, you know, where does this go? And, and so my birthday rolled around and I had a bunch of people send me bitcoins for my birthday, you know, $20, $30, $50. And anyway, accumulated to a number that when it traded at 19,000, you go, wow, that's some serious money. And, uh, but I just kind of, it was just little dribs and drabs. I didn't think about it. <laughs> I couldn't go back and find how to get to my money. I still haven't done it, so, yeah. Okay. We, we, Anybody we'll, here can help we'll me with that? We'll send a note to Coinbase. <laughs> let's, let's talk about 5G, because I know you've, uh, this, this is the future of uh, your company, of telecom. It's probably the biggest issue uh, in Washington these days. Yeah, it is. Just before we even get to the Washington issue, just, just paint a picture of what you think 5G looks like and how we and everyone in this room will interrelate to it in five years from now. Okay, so when we say 5G, the first thing everybody goes to is fast and no latency. And, and that is a fact. 5G will be just step change faster. I mean, it's gonna be a very fast network and, and there will be no latency. I mean, this is gonna be a zero latency, real-time network. And people in this room, you think about that, and Jim, I guarantee you, is sitting here thinking, wow, trading, okay, high frequency trading. Uh, I, my mind goes to gambling, right? Because zero latency gambling is going to be critical for that. But it's, it's so much more than just faster data flows. Because we're moving with 5G, what people don't appreciate, is to a world of just hyper connectivity. Connectivity beyond anything we've conceived of before. Because if you go to the world of Wi-Fi, you know, you could connect 100 devices to Wi-Fi. We went to 4G. Now, all of a sudden, you can start connecting thousands of devices to the network within every square mile, thousands of devices. So you and I could be on the highway in a car, two or three of us, and we each have a smartphone, we each have a watch, and the car itself is connected to the, to the network. Thousands of cars driving along in a square mile area, all connected to the internet. That was step change. That, that was big, that you could connect that many people to these networks. 5G, it goes from thousands to millions millions upon millions of simultaneous connections to these networks within a square mile. Okay, that's a big darn deal. Now pair that with, and I call this hypersecurity, because we're moving to a level, and if I were you, I would love this, where you, you can think of security from a very different perspective, because these millions upon millions of devices, rather than a world of 4G, where we can locate those devices within meters, we can now in 5G be able to locate those within centimeters. So every one of these devices, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a sensor somewhere on a highway, we can now locate those within centimeters. And so what does that mean for you? We can know who is on a network at any moment in time. We know what device they're carrying, and we can know very specifically with a high degree of precision where they are. So uh, you wanna do payments. With two-factor authentication, they log onto their device. You know it's who they said they are. We know the device they're on. It's what they said they were on. And we know location. Are they near the point of cell terminal where they're trying to authorize a transaction or an ATM or whatever? 
but you're starting to get to a level of precision that really changes how we think about authentication, how we think about identity in a digital world. And then you take that and you move it to what will be enabled then is miniaturization. And, and why is this important? Because as you think about distributed compute, so all of these devices that we carry around, they have a certain form factor because there's a lot of compute requirements in here. There's a lot of storage requirements in here, a lot of power requirements in here. In a world of 5G, instantaneous networks with all of this compute and storage right at the edge of the network, you don't need it on these devices anymore. Form factors begin to change radically. And think about virtual reality. This is your virtual reality experience today, right? You have this goofy thing that sits on your face like this. Get all of the compute and storage requirements out of this. This becomes the form factor for virtual reality. Those compute and storage ch changes are radical and they change the form factor of everything. Think about devices and sensors where you don't have to have compute and storage in a sensor. You don't have to have power requirements that you change batteries in two or three years. The sensors begin to become miniaturized at a level that we haven't considered before. Millions and millions of sensors within a square mile. Now what does that affect? That affects transportation. You think Waze is great because Waze is tracking this? Think about millions upon millions of sensors along a highway. Think about utilities and how utilities operate. Think about financial services. Think about refineries. I can go through every single area of infrastructure that will now be connected. And we're, we're moving to a hyper-connected society. And this is a really, really big deal. Society will be connected like we've not conceived. Now we're talking five, six, seven years from now when you have this kind of connectivity. But every one of these millions of devices per square mile is throwing out data, constantly throwing out data. Pair this with AI and you now start to have consumer insights, customer insights, environmental insights. And it bridges us to the comment that you went to and that is when you think about all of this, how much of our infrastructure is going to be tied to these 5G layers now you begin to appreciate why a lot of people are debating and our government is debating who should be the underlying kind of vendors that are providing this kind of equipment when your entire infrastructure is now tied to this. This is not about can people listen in on communications if they wanted to or can they steal our data. No, this is talking about who's controlling the fundamental infrastructure layer of a society. Okay, so let me ask you then a related question, which is Huawei is in the news constantly. It would be an example. It would be an example of a, of a company that's been in the news. And there is a view, depending on which side of that view that you take, that the government is blocking Huawei because of a security concern? And there is another view that Huawei is being blocked because of an innovation concern, which is to say that from an innovation standpoint, the view is that we want U.S. companies to own the 5G space. Security may be part of it, but it's also an issue in terms of who is going to go first, who is going to get ahead. Where, what do you think is going on here in Washington? Right? I don't think you can separate the two issues. I absolutely do not believe you can separate the two issues. Our, our government has declared that uh, AT&T, Verizon, you guys, you cannot use Huawei. So we say, okay, we get it. All right, there are people, for the reasons I articulated, there are people who are concerned from a national security standpoint about having a company that, that they have concerns about propagated throughout our networks. But do you, have, do you personally have those same concerns? I don't think you can lay out a vision that I just articulated, which I don't think is a rocket science vision. I think it is inevitable. That's where we are going. And I don't think you can view a scenario like that where so much of our infrastructure is, is, uh, is tied to these networks and fail to ask the question, who should be right. involved in the underlying but, infrastructure? But you probably saw it. There was an interview recently with the CEO of Huawei who said, we don't give any of this information to the Chinese government. I would never allow it. Did you that's, not, that's not the issue of information. And that's the point I keep trying to make. Consider for a moment, here's the reality. So the US, we're not gonna deploy this equipment. In Europe, it's about a 60% market share in 4G is Huawei in Europe today. 60% in most of the major countries. And Huawei, interestingly enough, does not facilitate interoperability from 4G to 5G other than their own networks. So 60% is 4G. What's the implication to 5G then in Europe? 
The implication is it's going to be a Huawei-driven 5G environment in Europe. Now just ask yourself a question for a moment. How comfortable are you, if you're a senior person in one of these countries, that that much of your infrastructure that's underpinning this much of our social interaction is being controlled, controlled is the wrong word, supplied by, I don't care if it's Huawei, but by a Chinese company. Should we have any concern with that? And I think it's a really logical question for governments around the world to ask. And what do you think the answer should be? Well, I think a real simple answer is, if Huawei you want to operate in this particular country, then there needs to be interoperability. You need to allow Nokia or Ericsson or Samsung to interoperate a 5G network on top of yours. That's a good first step. So that you're now not just locked in to one player, one provider for 5G. And by the way, their global market share is impressive. And it is so impressive that if they dominate in 5G, then suddenly the other companies on which we are dependent in the United States, are, they're hurt, they're impaired, they can't invest in R&D, and so who falls behind? The countries that can't use that company that is now dominating the global marketplace. And so this, this actually serves to hurt the United States and our competitiveness. And that's why I say you can't separate national security from competitiveness and innovation. They go hand in hand. Let me ask you a related security and privacy question, which is to say, what do you think about encryption today? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg recently made a major pivot at Facebook to suggest that he wants to move the company towards uh, almost a, a, an entirely encrypted uh, network. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? <laughs> uh, this is one of these big societal questions that it's probably above my pay grade, but I think it's a question for that's a high pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a very high pay grade. Uh, but look, what, what do we as a society want? Uh, this is a classic dilemma. Privacy, security. And those are two ends of a, of a spectrum, and you have to ask yourself as a society, where do you want to be? And if you are foundationally and fundamentally a pro-privacy, we want all privacy, government should never intervene, then you are over here. But when the you-know-what hits the fan, and we know XYZ right. individual is, has information and has a device or something, and the government needs to get to that so we can secure you know, our nation's uh, infrastructure or people or lives or whatnot, then suddenly people start to move over here. And so we've kind of set this paradigm. We have many in government who want to be over here. We have many in business, Facebook and others, which I, I understand what they're doing, who want to be over here. I don't think it lives on one of those two ends of the spectrum. But as the network, what do you think? Because everybody's going to build a layer on top. You look even, by the way, not just a layer on top, it could be multiple layers. In China, WeChat right. effectively has layered, if you will, what an Android operating system effectively is, or right. even what an iOS Apple system is. So this is, this is kind of an interesting dilemma for our government because our government, there are a lot of laws that have been in place for a long time for network operators. Right. And you know how we are required to share information with our government, and there are FISA courts and, and things where they can subpoena information, and so we have to provide that information. And I'm saying, that is almost irrelevant anymore because all of the information now resides out here. It doesn't reside in these networks. And so from a security standpoint, the bad guys have all figured this out. And so their information and their communication is residing out here. And so when you talk about encrypting things, don't, don't worry about the network. It's almost irrelevant from this standpoint. You better ask what do you want to do in the device level. Do you use Signal or any of those kind of things, WhatsApp? I do not, you deliberately. Do not. I, not? It's not that I wouldn't like to, right? but I do not deliberately. I, you might have read, I don't know, that sometimes I get asked for information from the Department of Justice. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very selective in terms of what platforms I use because the Department of Justice wants to know all of my communications at various points in time, so I, I don't touch those for that reason. Right. A uh, couple of just quick, uh, fun entertainment questions. Have you seen the new Game of Thrones before it comes out two weeks from now? No, I haven't seen it. You have not? No. They don't that doesn't it. seem right, does it? it you doesn't think seem that right. if you're CEO of a company that owns Game of Thrones, I could see the, the new Game of Thrones, but no, I have not. I have to go begging to Stanky to get like Star is Born early or something like that. <laughs> um, My it, wife thinks I'm like this really big deal. And when Star is Born came out and she hadn't seen it, and everybody, all these people she knows had seen it. She goes, 
I'm not as big a deal as you think I am. Um, speak to this. There have been a number of uh, very prominent departures from HBO, from Time Warner. I'm thinking specifically in this case of Richard Plepler. Right. Um, when you first bought the company, there was a view, or at least it seemed to be articulated, that the company was going to run relatively independently. Um, and that that was this crown jewel. Today, it feels like that company is being brought into the larger Warner media. Is that a, was that a pivot, a strategic shift? How do you think the public, when they read these headlines, should think about that? Uh, Richard Plepler was, you knew him well. I mean, he's a great executive and built a great franchise in HBO after Jeff Bukas uh, dro drove HBO for quite a period of time. Uh, as we began to think about how the world is changing, and by the way, the world is changing. The, the days when you can be at HBO and you can stand up and produce great premium content and your approach to market is to go through cable and satellite distributors, those days are over. You still go through cable and satellite distributors, they're still important, but you can no longer sit around and be reliant upon cable and satellite distributors. You have to figure out how to go directly to the consumer with premium content. And so this was the reality of what we knew we were gonna to have to do when we bought this company. We're gonna to have to take all of this content, go directly to the consumer. You have Turner Networks, you have HBO, their approaches to the market are very, very similar. They're different in terms of how they create content, but they have production engineers, they have accountants, they have lawyers in both places. We're going to invest a lot of money in HBO, hundreds of millions of dollars of additional money into creating great content. And so getting all of that redundant cost out and taking all that back office stuff and that redundant stuff and getting it out and really putting all this together and figuring out how do you create a direct-to-consumer platform that leverages this HBO content, but also Turner content and Warner Brothers was a different kind of play, a very different play. Richard Plepler had been doing this for a while. He made it really clear that wasn't, he wasn't into that transition. That was gonna be a hard push up. So Bob Greenblatt, we hired from NBC, you know him. He uh, was, did an amazing job at taking NBC to its heights in terms of where it was. He's come over. This is a great creative executive, media executive. He's running this play in terms of integrating HBO with Turner. It's not, when you said it's being pulled into Warner Media, I, I don't even know what that means. But it's just uh, Turner and HBO were integrating back office operations, taking that cost savings and plowing it well, into HBO content. When you HBO hear people content. say that there's a brain drain going on, you think what? Well, I don't know. Is Richard Plepler versus Bob Greenblatt a, drain, a brain drain? I, I don't. You know, I love Richard, but Bob is no, he's no chump, all right? This is a very talented executive, and so I, I feel actually right. pretty good about that. Okay, let me ask you a, a relatively controversial question before, before, I, before we get, leave the stage. Um, the head of Warner, Warner Brothers uh, Pictures, uh, Kevin Tejahara, uh, Ke Kevin uh, Tejahara, um, Sujihara. Sujihara, I apologize, was dismissed um, for a, a Me Too sexual harassment issue. Um, this was an issue you knew about before the company merged. Was that something you worried about? Of course we worried about it. Uh, in fact, we spent a lot of time talking to the Time Warner folks about, they had done an investigation on a report that came out. And, and, uh, and uh, so we looked at the investigation and, and we got ourselves uh, comfortable with what they were able to do. It was an independent investigation. Another report came up shortly after we closed. We hired a law firm to go do a same, uh, you know, an investigation as well and we, uh, you know, we couldn't find any evidence. Then all of a sudden this last report came up and there was some, some information revealed in a, in a news story that it made it clear. Uh, Kevin said that he made some mistakes and he said it was clear he was not gonna be effective in that role any further. And so we decided it was best to part ways. Okay, final question, uh, succession. Is it about the Redstones or is it about the Murdochs? I don't know, I've, I've always just assumed the Murdochs, but I, I don't know. Yeah, you would think, again, running the company, I would know that, but I don't. I, I, find, more, I find more satisfaction assuming it's the Murdochs because I know these guys, right? But uh, I don't know which it is. Randall Stevenson, thank you. Good to see Appreciate you. It. Thank, thank you. you very much. Much.